Today, we're going to be reading off of John chapter 7. Uh, we're going to go through uh, verse 25 through 36. So it says, Some of the people of Jerusalem were saying, Isn't this the man they are trying to kill? Yet look, he's speaking publicly and they're saying nothing to him. Can it be true that the authorities know he is from the Messiah? But we know where he, this man is from. When the Messiah comes, nobody will know where he is from. As he was teaching in the temple, Jesus cried out, You know me, and you know where I am from. Yet I have not come on my own. But the one who sent me is true. You don't know him. I know him because I am from him. And he sent me. Then they tried to seize him, yet no one laid a hand on him because his hour had not yet come. However, many from the crowd believed in him and said, When the Messiah comes, he won't perform more signs than this man has done, will he? The Pharisees heard the crowd murmuring these things about him, and so the chief priests and the Pharisees sent servants to arrest him. Then Jesus said, I am only with you for a short time. Then I am going to the one who sent me. You will look for me, but you will not find me. And where I am, you cannot come. And then the Jews said to one another, Where does he intend to go that we won't find them? He doesn't intend to go to the Jewish people dispersed among the Greeks and teach the Greeks, does he? What is the remark he made? You will look for me and you will not find me. And where I am, you cannot come. This is the word of God. Good morning, church. As always, I'm thankful for each of you gathering with us here today. As we say um, almost every week, our prayer uh, that is that you leave here today more in love with Jesus than when you came in uh, because of him being lifted up. Everything we do is trying to make his name famous and it's geared towards just lifting him up uh, because we believe that's what has the power to transform lives and in turn transform the world. Um, that drives everything we do. And we hope that you experience that today, uh, not by our power, not by you know anything that we do, but by the power of the Spirit. Um, if you're new, we especially want to welcome you. Uh, one of my hopes and prayers that we pray every Sunday morning is for anyone that's you know, new or you know, fairly new and is still connecting, that they would feel loved, that they would know that they are welcome. Now, as you know, we're human. We've all been in that environment where we're you know, new somewhere and we don't necessarily feel welcome and people don't always welcome perfectly, right? But our prayer is that the Spirit would comfort you and make you know that you really are loved. I also pray that those of us that have been a part of New Eden, that are regular attenders or members would, you know, it's to step outside of kind of that comfort zone and that bubble that we can get in and go meet other people and get to know them a little bit. Now, personally, like, I'm not really great at that myself. I'm, you can ask my wife, like, I'm not great at, like, the small talk, getting to know people. Uh, one of the things I do is I ask questions about their lives, and then, like, it's easy to forget those details, right? So even their name, right? You ask them their name, and it's like, you know, what was their name again? And, you know, it's helpful when I have my wife with me because she'll remind me we're walking up and I can pretend like I remembered their name. But, you know, I just don't necessarily do that. And I'm trying to think, like, what questions can I ask next, right? Um, you know, I would much rather just stand up here, you know, and preach a sermon. That doesn't bother me at all or intimidate me. But like, oh, go meet that new person. I'm like, all right, here we go. Let's go do it, right? But all of us, when we meet someone new, we have this process, however we frame the questions, of asking certain questions. Like, where are you from is one that's a, a big starter, right? Um, we kind of ask, who do you know? Especially in a smaller town, that's one that gets asked a lot. Um, what do you do? You know, what's your career? Um, what kind of hobbies do you have might be something we ask. We want to know what they're interested in. And as we progress in the relationship, and this is the part that I actually enjoy, we start to ask questions like, you know, what do you want to do in five years, right? I love asking that one. Like, if you could just be anywhere, be doing anything, where, where do you want to be, right? And we're kind of asking, like, what is your purpose in life? What is it that drives or motivates you? What is it that 
causes you to tick. Like I love those conversations when we get to sit down over lunch and, and ask questions like that. But all of the questions we ask, what we're really doing is trying to piece together who that person is. Who is the identity of that person, their personhood? And so that's what we're asking when we're asking them, where are you from, right? We're piecing that together. Who do you know, right? Um, we also ask them kind of about their, their hobbies, right? Um, what they do for work. We're not only trying to figure out who that person is, we're also trying to figure out like what they can do, right? What kind of powers they have, okay? And we live in a like Marvel Universe world, so I don't mean supernatural powers, right? But like, what can you do, right? What are your gifts? What are your callings? What things can you do? I love it when I've known someone for a while and I discover something about them that I'm like, oh my gosh, I didn't believe you could do that, right? Like every now and then I'll walk into the office and Kevin, our pastor for shepherding, will be sitting there and he's just like strumming a guitar and I'm like, you play the guitar. And I, I think I've been shocked like four times now because I forget that he can do it. But I'm like, I forget you can do that. That's really cool. Like, I wish I could play the guitar, right? I love that. And we learn um, about their abilities or their powers, right? What, what, that's a part of what makes them who they are and how God created them. And then lastly, and this takes more time typically, as we really get to know people, we discover their passion. What is it that makes them tick? What is their purpose in life? What is their mission? What drives them what motivates them? We get to know their person, their power, and their passion. And knowing these three things kind of gives us a snapshot about someone. And today in our sermon text, we're going to get to see the person, the power, and the passion of Jesus on display for us. As we typically do here at New Eden, we're working our way through a book of the scriptures in an expositional manner. And that means we just take the text and we allow it to dictate the topic for the day and, and what it means, but we always point it to Jesus. And today we're continuing in John's account of the gospel, specifically at John chapter 7, verses 25 through 36. Um, if you want to follow along, we typically use the CSB for our primary translation. We will have the verses on the screen. Uh, if you want to find your way there in your scripture notebooks, you can do that as well. Um, if you're looking for it, um, it's the fourth book of the New Testament. Follow along however you'd like on your phone or whatever. Um, as we've seen the last few weeks, if you remember, Jesus has been causing quite a stir among the crowd, and also among the religious elite of the day. He's been performing miracles, and as he's doing this with his words, he's also challenging the system of the day that kind of assumes that this certain group of people have an inside track to knowing God and knowing who he is, and he's pushed back against that. Last week, we saw that Jesus showed up at the festival of shelter secretly at first, and then about halfway through the week or sometime after halfway through the week, he stands up and starts teaching publicly in the temple. And we got to see some of his teaching and we got to see some of the crowd's response. And this is in that same context. Next week, we'll see a little bit more about why the festival of shelters matters for us. But this week, I want you to know it's still the same teaching. It's the same context. It could have been the next day. We don't know. Our author doesn't tell us, but it's the same kind of context. Jesus is still teaching in the temple. And in our text today, we get to see some more of Jesus's teaching and also some more of the crowd's response and the religious leader's response. So our text starts with the crowd actually responding to the teaching that we heard last week about Jesus saying, judge with righteous judgment. And we get to see their response in verses 25 through 27. Let's look at it together. It says, some of the people of Jerusalem were saying, isn't this the man they're trying to kill? Yet, look, he's speaking publicly and they're saying nothing to him. Can it be true that the authorities know he is the Messiah? But we know where this man is from. When the Messiah comes, nobody will know where he is from. And so from these verses and the following, we begin to discover the first thing we'll see, the person of Jesus. Now, up to this point in the Gospel of John, we've got to see a lot about the identity of Jesus. So we're not going to spend too much time rehearsing this and rehashing this, but it's helpful for us to see the response of the crowd to the teaching and works of Jesus. Some people of Jerusalem are hearing this man publicly stand up and teach in the temple, and they begin wondering why this is being allowed. This crowd knows that the religious elite are trying to kill Jesus. Now, some in our text last week did not know this. They said, Jesus, what are you talking about? But these people, that's why it says some of the crowd, these people know that. And so they're wondering where if they're trying to kill Jesus, why are they kind of giving their tacit approval to his message by letting him have this 
public stage. They're a little bit confused. And so um, what's going on here is maybe they think, well, the leaders have had a change of heart or something. You know, it shows us that this culture that the religious leaders had taught them that the religious leaders had the inside track and the insider information. He had to kind of come through me to get to God. And so they wonder, maybe they found out that he really is the Messiah. But they wonder aloud that, you know, this can't be so logically. They say there's no way this could be the Messiah because we've watched this Jesus man kind of grow up. We know where he was born. We know that he was born in Bethlehem and raised in Nazareth. I mean, this couldn't be the Messiah. There was this teaching, and this wasn't scripturally based, but there was this teaching from some of the religious leaders that when the Messiah came on the scene, he would essentially pop out of nowhere. Nobody would know who he was. And so they say, this can't be the case with Jesus. He's just this human man that we know his origins of. And in their statement here, there is a sense of irony. They thought they knew Jesus. I mean, they could tell you the physical origins of Jesus. He was born in Bethlehem. He was raised in Nazareth. But they absolutely miss where his true origin was. If you followed along with us in the Gospel of John, you know that by this time, Jesus has said multiple times, I'm from God, I'm from the Father, and I'm going back to the Father. He's saying, my origins, yes, I'm 100% human. I was born in a manger in Bethlehem, but I'm also 100% God, and that's ultimately where my origin is from. That's what he says in verses 28 and 29. Again, he emphatically says, look, I understand that you guys know me in like this earthly sense. I'll give you that. But if you really want to know who I am, you cannot divorce knowing me from knowing my father. You can't say that you really know me if you don't know God. And he says, I'm the one that knows God. And he says that he knows the Father. And this knowing is not like what we often think, this kind of mental descent. I can give you some facts about him, right? Like we talked about earlier. Do you know that person? Yeah, I kind of know where they're from and, you know, what they do for work. No, this is like an intimate knowledge. This is a relationship. He's saying, I am one with the Father. He's answering questions again about his identity. He's one with the Father. And he says, I'm sent by him. As Malachi, Malachi 5, 2 prophesies, he is the ruler who comes from Bethlehem. But as Malachi 5, 2 also says, his origin is from antiquity. He is from ancient times. He's always existed one with the Father and the Spirit, perfect triune God existing from eternity past. This is the person of Jesus. And in response to this teaching, we're told they tried to take and seize Jesus. Look at verse 30. Then they tried to seize him. Yet no one laid a hand on him because his hour had not yet come. Now, we're not told why they try to take him. Uh, this could be like when they try to take him by force and make him king. Maybe we're convinced he is some Messiah, and so we want to make him king. Or maybe this is a seizing him like they want to kill him. We're going to see that in a second. But either way, they're unable to do so. His time to be exalted had not yet come, and so they are unable to see, seize Jesus. We saw the person of Jesus, and here we see the power of Jesus. Not only do we see this crowd try to seize him, but later, as I said in a moment, we're going to see verse 32, the Pharisees send servants to try to arrest him, but we're also told that they are unsuccessful. Now, we're not given any earthly reason why they're unsuccessful. We're just told that, you know what? The hour of Jesus had not yet come. End of story. If God had not yet sovereignly planned this to happen, it is not going to happen. They are unable to apprehend Jesus. His time is not yet, and so no one can take the life of Jesus without his consent. Later in John 10, Jesus is going to state even more plainly when he's teaching to the crowd that, look, no one takes my life. I willingly lay it down, and he says, I have the right or the authority to also take it back up again. No one can just take my life. You're ridiculous if you think that. We see the power of Jesus here. See, all the plans of man. Both good and evil are simply working to accomplish the final glorious outcome that the Father has ordained in ages past. And nothing that man attempts can either speed up or slow down the hour of the Son of God. No more than man can tell the sun when to rise or when to set. 
This is based on the Father's will. We also see his power displayed through the signs and the miracles. In verse 31, we're told that there are some who begin to believe that he really is the Messiah. And their logic is like, guys, like, just look at the evidence. Do you think that when another Messiah comes, like, they're going to display more power than Jesus has displayed up to this point? And so this belief begins to take place in some of the crowd. And the religious authorities now have to act. They can't just sit back. You know, when Jesus was just spouting stuff and the crowd was kind of indifferent, okay, fine, we'll let him do his thing. We'll figure out a better time to kill Jesus. But they need to act because people are starting to believe him. And so in verse 32, they seek to arrest Jesus, as we mentioned a moment ago. But Jesus, I love this, like he's completely unfazed. Um, We get to see his response to the servants with the crowd still listening. And in this response, we get glimpses into the passion and the purpose of Jesus. Look at verse 33 and 34. Then Jesus said, I'm only with you for a short time. They're trying to arrest him. He says, guys, I'm, I'm only around for a short time. Then I'm going to the one who sent me. You will look for me, but you will not find me. And where I am, you cannot come. We saw the person of Jesus the power of Jesus, and now we see the passion of Jesus. Jesus says, look, guys, I I know you're getting all riled up about this, but just relax. Like, I'm only here for a little bit. I promise I'll be out of here soon. I'm going back to my father. Um, You can look for me however much you want, but you're not going to find me. And where I'm going and where in one sense I already am united with my father, you can't come. And here Jesus gives us a hint into the fact And this is important for us to see that his entire birth and life was working toward what we've seen called in the gospel of John as his time or his hour. This time when he would enter into death and eventually resurrect and ascend back to his father, the end goal being reunited with his father, ruling at the right hand with all authority granted to God, all glory given to God. And this was the singular passion of his work and ministry. And here's what we need to understand. It wasn't just about him getting back to God, getting back to the Father. Because if it was, he he never had a reason to leave in the first place. See, there was a bigger purpose in his descent, taking on flesh and living the life that he lived and in his path through the cross back to his Father. Is there any other way? Let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. There was no way going around the cross to reunite with his father. In John 13, he actually uses this same language of where I am going, you cannot come. And he tells them, you can't come with me. Peter's like, I'm I'm going with you, Jesus. And he's like, okay, Peter, calm down. Uh, Where I'm going, you cannot follow. And he tells them, but afterward, Peter, you will follow. Peter's like, what do you mean afterward? Like, I'll follow you now, I'll go to death. And I can see Jesus almost laughing like, Peter, you're not even gonna make it till the rooster crows three times and you're gonna deny me. Calm down. Like, but he says, I love this, because he says, afterward, you will follow. See, Jesus is making clear that no human can walk the path that he's walking without him first walking it. Where Jesus is and where Jesus is going is simply his union with the Father. And because of our sin, we cannot go where he is. We cannot go where he is going. We can't be united to the Father. Without the work of Jesus, without his life, death, burial, and resurrection, We cannot be one with our creator. And this work was the singular passion of Jesus. See, Jesus was right in saying that we could not go to where he was. So he came to us. We couldn't earn access to the Father, so he came and dwelt among us, tabernacled among us, which the tabernacle temple represented relationship and union with God in his presence. Jesus comes, takes on flesh, and he himself becomes the temple. He becomes the way to where he is going. 
That's what he tells Thomas a little bit later in chapter 14. Thomas says, tell us the way you're going so we can go too. And he says, I am the way. No one comes to the Father but through me. This is it. You're looking for a physical path to walk. And I'm saying, I am it. And this was the singular passion of Jesus. To offer a way that the entire world might be back into union with the Father. To reunite us to God so that God's glory might flood the entire cosmos. This is good news. This is the gospel. We couldn't go to where God was, so he came to us. That's what we see with his life and his incarnation as he dwells among us. The flesh that he told us to feast on. He lives the perfect life, constantly in perfect union with his father. Never trading that for the things that the tempter put before him. And as he walked into his passion, as it's called, his journey to the cross, as he walks this dark way, He is providing a way for rebel sinners who have hearts of unbelief. He's providing a way for all who trust in him, all who simply believe in him, to follow him into his death so that the old man might be crucified and we might also receive true life. That was his passion. That's why on the cross, he cries out, it is finished. The work that I came to accomplish is complete to die for the sins of the world. And this perfect person, Jesus, this Messiah, is nailed to a bloody Roman cross so he might accomplish the work he came to do so that he might become sin for us who knew no sin. And as they lay him in the grave, he trusts that his father will resurrect him on the third day. And that's exactly what happens, right? Right? Jesus walks out of the grave and he again affirms that he is the powerful one. He is more powerful than sin, death, and the grave. And what I love about this, that this good news goes out to all. As he told the Samaritan woman, you can worship Jesus anywhere. Not just on this mountain, not just in this temple. Like it's going open to everyone. All have a way to the Father. And the way is a person, Jesus, the Messiah. And unlike the religious elite, right, who kind of taught that they had this insider access to God, they kind of knew God more than others. This is not how it is with Jesus. John shows us this with this ironic response from the crowd that I love in verses 35 and 36 at the end of our text. So the Jews, when Jesus says, hey, I'm going away, you're not going to find me, you can't come where I'm going. So they say to one another in verse 35, where does he intend to go that we won't find him? I mean, he doesn't intend to go to the Jewish people dispersed among the Greeks and teach the the Greeks, those Gentiles, does he? Can't be that. I mean, what is this remark he made? You will look for me and you will not find me and where I am, you cannot come. The crowd is trying to understand this statement from Jesus as they often do and as we often do in earthly terms. And the only plausible thought they had was, well, maybe he's talking about going to the Jewish people dispersed among the Greeks since most of these people aren't accepting the message. He'll go out to those Gentiles people, Gentile people, maybe use the Jewish people dispersed there to kind of start a movement and start teaching the Gentiles and the Greeks. And when they say he doesn't intend to teach the Greeks, does he? You need to read this with a level of disgust, like dripping off your lips, because that's how it reads and how it would have been understood. I mean, this is a stupid idea to them. Like, they don't even actually give it any time of thought. They don't even entertain it, entertain the idea. They say there's no way that those people would be where the Messiah would actually go to launch his kingdom. And oh, the irony. These people, like the high priest Caiaphas, we'll see later, was prophesying truth without even knowing it. This gospel was open to all, and this was the passion and mission of Jesus. This is why he was sent, to provide a way for everyone who believes. It's why the whole gospel of John was written. Regardless of social status, ethnicity, background, or any other defining marker that our society wants to place on people. 
God's glory is meant to flood the entire earth, not just our little pocket of it and our little denomination and our little you know, English speaking people. Like God's glory is meant to flood the entire cosmos. And the beauty of the gospel is that it's open to all, especially those who you think least deserve it. And I don't know who that is for you. I know some of those groups of people who naturally that is for me. And I have to remind myself, and this text reminds me that the gospel is open to all. And this is what happens. Shortly after the resurrection, the gospel absolutely expands among those pagans, those barbarians, the Greek, the very people that the religious leaders set up the entire system to try to exclude. The gospel goes forth to all. And 2,000 years later, guess what? We're the benefits of that. We're the Gentiles in the story. We don't have insider access to God. The only insider access to God is through the way, the truth, the life, and Jesus And here's the beauty of this. I can say with full assurance on the scriptures that no matter who you are or what you've done, no matter your background, no matter your answer to those questions that people ask you to try to get to know you and see how much value you have based on what you know or where you're from or who you know, no matter what your answer to those questions are, I can tell you that this is good news for you and that this is an invitation to you to simply believe on the work of Jesus. It's why John wrote his entire book. And here's the amazing thing, that for those of us that believe in the life, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, we become new persons. We become and receive a new identity. We're no longer defined by those questions primarily of who we are and what we do and what our purpose is. We receive the person, power, and passion of Jesus as our own. So this is something that we need to get as the church. The gospel of Jesus is not just for some sweet by and by. You kind of got your ticket to make sure you sneak into the pearly gates of heaven and, you know, God's wrath doesn't fall on you. So I'm good now. No, like the gospel of Jesus actually like floods into our life and changes everything about us. We are not just saved from the sin that separates us from the father. We are also saved to something. We are saved to become more like Christ, like his person. We are actually, believe it or not, called to operate in the same power of the spirit that he did. And we're called to have the same passion, the same purpose, the same mission that Christ did. The gospel actually transforms you and changes you from the inside out. We become a new person if anyone's in Christ. He's a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. We receive a new identity. Our old man is crucified as we follow him on the road to death. But in his life, a new man is birthed. And as we've seen in John, the sanctifying work is Jesus's alone. He's going to complete the sanctifying work in you. That's what Jesus tells the 12 in John 14. He says, hey guys, I'm going to go away. But he says, when I'm gone, I'm going to prepare a place for you so that where I am, you can be also. In my father's house, there are many rooms for you. And I'm going to come back just like I came the first time. And I'm going to take you to where I am so that you may be there also. Wait, I thought you said we couldn't go. Well, you can't on your own, but in me, let's go. I'm taking you for the ride. And just as he came the first time, he's coming back the second time to finish his work. We are not fully yet where Christ is. There's a sense in which we are this already, but not yet. But one day we will see him face to face and our eyes will behold his beauty and we will be presented fully white and sanctified in robes of white. There's a room in his house for everyone who receives this new person, this new identity as sons and daughters of God. And here's the thing. In this already not yet, this stage where we long for his return, we're not left on our own. We're granted the power of the spirit that he said was actually better. We'll see that more next week. Better that the spirit would be here than that Jesus himself physically would be here. What? Okay, Jesus, that don't make sense. Like, I'd love to physically see him, but he says, no, like the power of the spirit in the lives of the true temple, the, the, with Jesus as the cornerstone, we are the temple. And so we have that power that Jesus had. We can be confident that nothing can touch us or harm us, that God is not sovereign over and that he will not work for our good and for his glory. And that can become trite. 
I don't want that to become trite. It's true that we are held in the Father's hand and that only in his way and in his timing can the enemy attack. And we can be confident that even when the enemy is allowed to attack, that those attacks are turned against the enemy to work towards his own destruction, just like it was in the cross and the resurrection. And that doesn't mean I understand how all this works. And that's where things become trite. When we say, just hang in there, it's going to work out. You're going to be thankful one day. Well, I don't know if that one day is going to be on this side of new creation, but I know that a day is coming. And it doesn't mean we gloss over sin and its effects and life is hard. Jesus' path to the cross was difficult and long. He sweat drops of blood thinking about it. But it does mean that on this long and winding journey, you are never alone. In Matthew 28, when Jesus sent out his disciples to continue this kingdom work that he had started, He says, I have all the authority. I'm the one in charge. And then he says, I am with you always, even unto the end of the age. You are not alone in your lowest of lows. Jesus is there. And as this happens, as we, by the power of the Spirit, become new people, new persons with new power, we have a new passion. This is something that if we as the church could begin to grasp That we as the people of God receive the passion and the mission of Jesus as our own. This same passion that Jesus had, singularly focused, eyes fixed on the prize. This same passion that he had sent by the Father, we receive as our own passion and mission. And all the other goals and dreams that we have begin to fade into the background begin to be released from this script. We think those things will fulfill us. The American dream, the white picket fence, whatever it is, the things that we live for, those things begin to slip away because the mission and passion of Jesus becomes our singular driving focus. Just as Jesus was sent by the Father. Like if, if we, if I could grasp this, in the same way Jesus sends you. That's what he tells his disciples in John 20, 21. He says to them again, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. You, no matter who you are, sitting there thinking you don't have gifts to offer the church, you can't speak or you can't do certain things, you are sent. Jesus has commissioned you the same way that the Father commissioned him to this world. What? And he entrusts a broken people with that? Yes, he does, because he's promised to accomplish his mission. This is why we say that in a sense, we are all missionaries. No, not all cross-cultural missionaries, but we are all missionaries as an identity, not as a new legalism. We don't just do mission so we don't feel guilty about it and because the pastor announced that there was a serve day, so we better all show up because, you know, we want to look good and get our marks for Jesus and get the sticker, you know, like we did in Sunday school because we memorized the verse. There's some of my baggage coming out. That, that's not what's going on here, Right? Like this is not a legalist. It's an identity. God is a missionary. God, we become a missionary people. We can't escape this. It's who we are. This is one of the reasons why at New Eden we talk about the gospel going forth to unreached peoples. This is why we give, we pray, we mobilize, we educate, and we send, and we go, if called, to take the gospel to unreached people. Like today, there are still people, unreached groups of people who live and die and never hear the good news of Jesus. And we are all called to play a part. And I promise you, whether you think it or not, there is a part for you to play no matter who you are, no matter your gift sets. As John Piper has said, there are only three kinds of Christians when it comes to missions, goers, senders, and the disobedient. See, when the passion of God becomes our own, it changes us. But it doesn't just transform how we think about those across the world. It also transforms how we think about those across the street. We begin to take the gospel to whoever the other is for you. Those who look different than you. Those who voted differently than you. Those who have different cultural values than you. Those that are flesh would think there's no way Jesus could use them Could he? No way. No way that's a part of his plan. But we begin to see people as image bearers made in the image of God and the gospel goes forth to all. 
This is why our heart for New Eden and our prayer is that we would reflect the beautiful diversity of our city. And you don't, this doesn't just happen. Like this takes the power of Jesus breathing in life into us. And it's just us being simply faithful to who God's called us to be. We're sent people and there's no qualification to who we're sent to. And so we go out to all and it simply happens. And this isn't just so we look better on our website. Like, this is the glory of God at stake. Like, his glory is more fully displayed and shown through multiple groups of people worshiping him in unity together. The end aim of all of this gospel passion, the end aim of the passion of Jesus was the worship of God expanding. It's the end aim and it's the driving motivation behind it. This is so much bigger than just our little corner of the earth and our own little pocket and our own little cultural priorities. This this means laying aside interests like Jesus did to rescue a people that were the other for him. Laid aside his own interest, took on the form of a servant. This takes us laying aside those things, having kingdom priorities instead of our own. Living in unity with those who are different than us, those we see as the other, takes the spirit of God breathing on us and giving us eyes to see. And here's the thing, that as we surrender to Jesus, as we trust in his work, we receive his person, his power, and his passion, and we begin to see Jesus more fully and be with him. The Jews asked, what do you mean that we're going to look for you and we can't find you and that we can't go to where you're going? God in his sovereignty has given us that answer in the diverse, unified church being sent out to the world. See, we now become the temple, the cornerstones, the ones that are tangibly displayed to the world. This is where God is, not a building, but in the lives of his people. And we say, you're all welcome based on the work of Jesus. That's in all of life, not just some building on a Sunday morning. You are a sent one, a missionary on the job, in your classroom, wherever else you may find yourself in the home, That's why our primary aim as God's people is not to lift up ourselves and how great of people we are. And if you're good enough, then you can be a Christian. But we just lift up the name of Jesus. It's much bigger than one person or one church. We say it all the time. It's not about New Eden. We just get to hop on and be a part of God's glory expanding to the cosmos. And so as we gaze on Jesus, who was sent to save us, may we in turn go and be sent to the world around us from the neighborhoods to the nations telling them that through simple faith and belief in Jesus, they too can become a new person with new power and a new passion for God's glory among all people.